On this episode, we're gonna do another question and answer. You guys asked a bunch of questions, I got a bunch of answers, and we are gonna get started right now. Hey, what's up guys? This is Nick from Nick Expose, and like I said in the intro, uh, we are gonna be doing another question and answer. I got a bunch of questions in on Instagram over the last few days. If you're not following me on Instagram, it's at Nick Exposed. Anytime I do question and answers or anything like that, uh, I'm always tossing that out to the Instagram community. So uh, if you wanna be on this list in the future, you can definitely follow over there and, uh, and hit your chance on the next time around. Uh, but I'm gonna go through these just as they came in. And uh, we're just gonna kind of roll through it. As you guys know, I can get kind of long-winded on some of these. I'm gonna try and keep them as precise and clear and concise as possible. But at the same time, uh, I may go off on some tangents. So uh, just bear with me. We have some fantastic questions in today and I really look forward to giving uh, hopefully some thought out answers uh, to a bunch of them. So first question comes in from Talk Photography and it says, do you think there are too many YouTube channels devoted to photography as of right now? Is the, margic, is the market too saturated? And do you think there will always be room for one more channel? Uh, I absolutely love this question because it's actually a question that I was asking myself just earlier this year of going into starting my YouTube channel, thinking, man, you know, Matt and, and Ted Forbes and uh, you know, all these guys are, are just covering so much of this stuff so well already. Where's my place in this thing and is it even worth it for me to come out with a channel as well? And I think, uh, I think this goes beyond YouTube, but I think this is something that we ask oftentimes like, man, is the wedding photography market too saturated? Is the entertainment photography market too saturated? Is the gallery and exhibition market too saturated? As long as you do things from a standpoint of authenticity and excellence, uh, not excellence as in perfection, but excellence as in uh, truly thinking through the things that you're trying to put out into uh, society or into the film community or anything like that. I think if we just approach things from authenticity and not trying to imitate others, I think there's always room for new voices in that sense. Uh, you'll always see time and time and time again people coming through and breaking through all the noise because they're being true to themselves and authentic in their voice and it resonates with people. Uh, the, the cool thing is, is my channel isn't like Ted Forbes, my channel isn't like Matt Day's and I love their channels and it would have been just as easy for me to go, man, I wanna be like Matt, I wanna be like Ted and go out there and do the things that they're doing. When I was truly like going through and reflecting on what it was that I have to bring to the table, it's much more of a reflective side. That's why I like to go in and talk about uh, you know, like just the artistic side and the creative side and the thinking side and everything like that. And Ted does a great job on, on talking on those things as well, but he goes about it in a different way. The thing is, like it's so easy for me to make these videos because I'm just being me and I'm just kind of bringing my voice into the platform and I think there's always room for another voice in conversations as long as it's just authentic and it's not just trying to sound like somebody else's voice, if that makes sense. So, no, I don't think it's too saturated. Yes, I do think that there's a lot of photography channels out there. I think that there's a lot of fantastic photography channels out there. And I think there's probably a, a million, you know, mediocre and subpar photography channels out there because people are trying to be Matt Day. People are trying to be Ted Forbes. People are trying to be negative feedback. And really what the world needs is not you trying to be someone else. It's you trying to be you. And as long as you're doing that, I think there's always room uh, for another channel or another uh, exhibition, another wedding photographer, whatever it might be. Go out there and be you. At Gabe Anzalini uh, says, what makes you choose photos to share? Uh, why HP5, why 1600, and why the, the 50 millimeter over the 35 or the 28? Fantastic questions. I'm gonna answer them one at a time. So what makes you choose the photos that you share? On social media, especially within Instagram, a lot of the times I'll do series, like currently I'm sharing a bunch of photos from Chicago a while back. Um, the way that Instagram and the uh, Instagram feed, like looking back on your own feed, breaks down is it breaks down in, in chunks of three, right? You have three, 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 and that makes that grid. So I try and share, at least lately, uh, for the last few months, I've been trying to share to where the three in that like slot actually play off of each other, whether it's they're all uh, portraits, whether it's they're all horizontal, they're all vertical, whatever it might be, they're all single subject matter, they're all single 
Um, density of, of value, right? Darker images, lighter images, anything like that. Um, I've been trying to share in that way, but um, other than that, it's kind of no rhyme or reason. Instagram is kind of a, a little bit of a creative playground, and uh, I'm not always choosing my you know, top work to share out there. You guys, if you follow uh, the Instagram feed, you know from time to time I like to throw out some images that I'm struggling with and that I'm kind of on the fence of or that I absolutely botched and I just kind of want to share that with you guys. So I always try and have at least a little bit of a story to tell with it, even if I, even if I don't put the story in the description, there's always kind of a reason to put it up there. Um, but at the same time, it's not like super in depth. A lot of the times it's just trying to go within a certain theme. So I hope that answers that question. Why HP5? Uh, I just absolutely love HP5. I tried out a bunch of different black and white platforms, especially for pushing, and I find that at least in my experience, HP5 pushes by far uh, the best out of any black and white film. I love the grain structure that HP5 gives me when it's pushed to 1600 and beyond. Plus, it's so much cheaper to buy in bulk than it is to buy uh, Tri-X in bulk. So it just keeps my, my costs down and makes film much more approachable for me. Uh, why 1600? There's actually, I, I wanna do like a whole t-shirt and hat series on this, but there's three words that I would describe on why I pushed to 1600 and I'm actually going to, my light's shifting on me. So there's three uh, words that would describe why I shoot at 1600 and I would say that's contrast, grain, and soul. Uh, I absolutely love the contrast that pushed HP5 gives. I absolutely love the grain structure. If you guys know, I'm an absolute grain junkie. Uh, I love good grain as long as it's appealing. But then soul, I just feel like there's a, a certain characteristic that pushed HP5 has, and it just kind of has this life of its own. When you look at it, you're like, yep, that's HP5 pushed to 1600. There's a certain recognizable characteristic that pushed HP5 or pushed film in general has. So that's why 1600 and then why 50 millimeter over 35 millimeter or 28. Um, I don't just shoot 50 millimeter, I do shoot 35 millimeter. Lately I've been gravitating towards the 50 much more lately. So the way that I would break it down is I use a 35 millimeter oftentimes when I'm photographing people within a street scene. Uh, I love being able to get up closer to people and capture the whole scene as an essence. Uh, I think it works great as an environmental portrait for people uh, and then 50 is when I uh, want to like kind of dive in and get the details of a scene which lately has been how my brain has been uh, working much more I don't shoot a 28 millimeter one because I don't have the uh, frame lines on my Leica for 28 and two I just feel like it's a little too wide um, I know that there's other people that like getting extremely close to people. I do think that there's a, a kind of a bubble around people that I don't necessarily like crossing into. I think there's a point of approaching someone and interacting with them in a up close, intimate manner. And then I think there's a point of obnoxion uh, to where you're just obnoxiously close and, uh, and just really inside somebody's personal bubble. And I don't like uh, approaching scenes that way. So that's why the 50 and that's why the 35. At Voitech 0 says, how, how many times do you let yourself fail before giving up on an idea or a project? I think this is a, a very interesting question and it actually made me think, and I don't have an absolute definite answer for you. Um, I think for me, there's a lot of projects that I just get so amped up on and I could see in my head so well that I just can't let myself continue to fail. Like I'll continue to fail until I hit something that like at least remotely um, puts into pictures or words of what I'm trying to do with that project. So um, then there's other projects to where you just lose steam on them. And uh, I, I kind of keep like a running notebook of ideas and I'm always jotting down ideas uh, and sometimes I'll revisit those projects later under kind of a, a fresh light or fresh kind of mindset but uh, I think for each project it just kind of squeeze it until the life runs out of it I would say just keep pushing into it until you just absolutely lose steam on it and you just don't want to work on it anymore I don't know that's kind of how I approach things I'll, I'll work them until and until they work out or I'll work them until I'm just exhausted and I lost all vision for the project so you'll just kind of have to to feel that one out yourself. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, next one comes from at MTV Cribs. This is my buddy here in town. Uh, what's your favorite piece of work you've ever made and why? This is an extremely interesting question and I, I still don't, I thought about it quite a bit and I still don't have uh, 
any great answer to give you. I would say there's three pieces that stick out in my mind. There's one, which is the birds in flight photo, which you guys are, are familiar with, um, I'm sure. I'm gonna put it up on the screen here, but um, this is one of those ones that like, I don't try and make standalone images that often. I like building a story, I like building a, a sequence of images up to tell a greater story, but this is one of those ones to where, even though I'm putting it in a future zine with a bunch of others to tell a story, I think it just stands well on its own by itself. And I think this image has just kind of had a, a life of its own. It's kind of gone on to, to have different successes and different things. It's been my most popular image, my most sold image, and all those different things. So the second image I would refer to is an image that I took in, in Chicago two years back. And it's of a couple guys walking out of what I believe is a bank. Um, and they just have this like Chicago feel to them. They have this soul to them, right? These guys are like almost like a modern day Rat Pack type of thing. And the beautiful thing about this image is I initially discarded it because the main guy, you'll see it up here on the screen, um, the main guy was out of focus. I missed focus because I was shooting with a point and shoot and it grabbed focus on the guy behind him. And I still kind of had this idea of images had to be perfect and everything like that. Uh, I don't know, at first it just bugged me, but after a while, it just grew on me and it quickly became uh, kind of a game changer for me. It started changing the way that I thought about my work, changing the way that I thought about photography, how everything didn't have to be perfect. And I think it was instrumental in changing the direction of my photographic eye, if that makes sense. Uh, also, it was the first piece that was actually published in other publications. So it got published in uh, two other publications. The other one that I uh, mentioned got published in a publication as well. Uh, and I think that those ones, those are my first like published actual pieces off there living in somebody else's book, living in somebody else's zine. Uh, and they just kind of ring true for me. And then the last one that I would mention is one that I also made in Chicago earlier this year. Uh, and it's the hand on the rail. I just absolutely love that image. It, it just is so much of where I'm trying to head with my photography and the details and the small little like in between moments and the stuff that kind of leaves you with more questions than answers. Uh, and I absolutely love that image. So uh, I think it's a, probably a cop out for giving three different answers. But as of right now, those are the ones that come to the top of my mind. Uh, next question comes from Murphy's Film. If you guys know Garth, I've talked about him on here a couple times. He also comes into the live streams uh, quite often, almost every week. And he says, Nick, will you try instant coffee for this video? Garth. If you guys know Garth and I, we kind of go back and forth. Garth uh, drinks instant coffee. I'm kind of a, what some people might call a coffee snob. Uh, I definitely like my craft coffee and uh, I've given him kind of a, a hard time about his uh, instant coffees. I don't know, Garth, you'll have to wait until the end of the video and uh, we will see if I might try some instant coffee just for you. Uh, I can't make any promises, but I can say wait until the end of the video. Next question comes from Hannah O'Brien Photography. What would be the best way to get the word out there for a zine or project where you're at the stage of wanting to sell it? Uh, I do wanna, and I, I let Hannah know this beforehand, but I do wanna make actually a, a more in-depth video for this, especially in the zine series, which I am gonna be getting to soon of bringing some more of those videos out. Um, but I do wanna talk about this idea of, it's actually gonna be a, a whole nother series of videos on selling your work online. I've been blessed enough to, to have quite a bit of my work sell online. Uh, it's a big way on how I fund the rest of my photography and all of my personal projects and stuff like that. A lot of it is self-funded by the work that I'm selling online. Uh, also, this YouTube channel is, is funded by the work that I'm selling online, whether it be my t-shirt line or uh, whether it be the zines or prints or anything like that. So anytime you guys ever purchase any of that stuff, thank you. You're making these videos possible. You're making all of my personal projects possible and uh, I just really appreciate that. But the big question is how do you actually get out there to promote your work and how do you actually get the sales? So a couple things I would say is probably Instagram has been my, my largest, not even probably, Instagram has been my largest sales tool um, for pushing out my work. Uh, I think it's a perfect platform for us as film photographers, as photographers, as creatives in general because it's a creative platform. It's other people and I, I find that a majority of the other people that are purchasing my work is other creatives. Um, people that have found 
some sort of inspiration in my work or have found at least that they resonate with that story or at least with me or anything like that. And I think that's key. I don't think that that's arrogant to say. I think that if you want to sell your work to people, you have to find people that are gonna resonate with you, resonate with your work, find your work inspirational and, uh, and really connect with the story that you're saying with your artwork. Another thing I would say is really build the story up. So if you're going into uh, kind of a, a season or whatever you wanna call it of trying to sell that piece or that body of work or anything like that, start early and start telling the story about that work. People buy out based off of an emotional response. People buy because they connect with the things that they, that they see and they see things that move them in a certain way. Even if the piece itself didn't move them, but the story behind the piece moved them, they'll still make that purchase. Like I said, this is kind of a big topic to kind of try and pack into uh, a smaller topic, but I would say learn to tell stories well and tell the stories of the pieces that you want to sell. If it's a zine, Tell the story of one, what the zine is about, how you shot the zine, what you went through in creating the zine, and then two, uh, how you actually went about making the zine. That's one of the beautiful things about the, the zine making series that I, I did earlier this year. Um, the rest of the zines that I was selling sold out real quick um, because people got to see the process behind everything. Yeah, I would just say, just share as much story and as much about the pieces as you can and really kind of build up that uh, emotional response in people and they'll know whether they emotionally connect with it. You're not trying to force people into emotional responses. They will know if they resonate with your art or not. At D Kamenev, uh, I think that's how I say your, your handle, uh, asks, address the baseball cap question. Why do you wear it? Why are a lot of photographers wearing them nowadays? Um, I don't know that I've necessarily noticed that a lot of photographers wear them nowadays, and that could very well be true, but I can address why, why I wear it. Uh, I do wear baseball caps quite a bit. I also have my other tan hat that I wear quite a bit, and it's for a couple different things. Um, I'll be completely honest with you guys. Nowadays, uh, in my 30s now, uh, I have a bit of a receding hairline. I don't know if you guys could see that, but um, since probably 26, 27, my hairline started receding and uh, it's really kind of bugs me. So I'll be honest, uh, I wear hats a lot of the times to hide that. But two, I've always been a hat guy. I really enjoy hats. Uh, I really enjoy hats that really represent stuff that I love. Um, I've wore my sailing hat in the past. It has, it says the arbitrage on there. That's a, a sailboat that I used to race uh, years back with a, a team that I used to crew on with. Uh, I have another sailing hat. Um, and then this hat here is Two Stops Apparel, which is my apparel line. This is probably the hat that I'll be wearing most of the time just to constantly uh, be branding and, and hitting market. And, uh, and yeah, hopefully that answers your question. At Pablimo uh, asks, do you shoot color? Did you shoot color before black and white? If not, uh, would you switch from black and white to color? Um, I actually addressed this in a recent Two Minute Tuesday. I'll link up to it up here in the top. Um, but uh, I did shoot a lot of color back in the day. Uh, a little over a year ago, I was shooting a lot of color, a lot of black and white, and I was kind of balancing between the two. I made a creative decision to really kind of challenge myself to see in a certain way, and that way was black and white. I still shoot color. Uh, I'm working on a color project actually as we speak. Um, but it's probably gonna be a long-term uh, project and it probably isn't gonna hit the streams for quite a while. I have, no, I have no definite answer for when the color work will be hitting the streams, but for the time being, it'll still be black and white. Also, black and white is super easy to bulk load and develop at home, and I really love the process of black and white. I absolutely love black and white, um, so I don't know. I, I don't think there will ever be a time to where I switch entirely from black and white to entirely color. Um, there may be a time to where I go back into working color into a majority, or like, not a majority, but a decent amount of workflow. Um, but I don't see that happening for a while. I'm really, really enjoying staying put in black and white, and it's really continuing to develop my creative eye. Next question comes from Tomalog, says, which other artists do you find most inspiring? Uh, this is a great question, and I'm actually gonna break out of the box of what I think some of you guys might anticipate, because I've talked a lot about the guys that uh, really kind of drive me within photography, Ralph Gibson, Elliot Erwitt, Kit Young, uh, Jay Maisel, just so many different guys. Uh, I talk about them a lot. So I'm actually gonna break outside of the box of photography and I actually wanna go in and say uh, a lot more of the artists that inspire me are probably more on the musical side. So B.B. King, Stevie Ray Vaughan, uh, Miles Davis, Coltrane, Bill Evans, 
uh, Black Keys, Jack White. I absolutely love Jack White. I love the way that his mind thinks about analog and the analog process. I feel like uh, just there's so many different similarities. When I watch an interview with Jack White talking about the analog process, I'm just like constantly going, yes, 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 like, yes, that's exactly what I'm thinking as far as film photography or as far as why I listen to records or anything like that. So I find a, a ton of uh, just inspiration. Music inspires my work so much. Um, so even, even classicals like uh, Beethoven and Mozart and uh, Bach and uh, Chopin, I absolutely love sitting down and allowing music to just kind of wash over me, allowing music to really kind of speak to just who I am. And uh, even Josh Gerrels, he like really breaks outside of the, the box of like really any kind of music sense. Uh, and he's just a, a fantastic lyricist. And these, I don't know, the way that guys are able to pair up lyrics with audio and just have it all flow and build compositions around that, it, it just inspires the way that I think about my photography, the way that I think about my sequencing. I would also say like another way to break out of the box of, of describing the, pla the different places that I find inspiration on is outside of the, the standard idea of what artist is, I also love watching um, skaters, so skateboarders and then, I mean, even like when I was shooting the boxing stuff and watching these guys as they, they move and they duck and they weave in, in boxing, just watching anybody move in their area of expertise, getting to watch people move in a, in a place that they've become so comfortable in and, and have taken years and years and years to, to just pour into a thing, to learn it on a certain level. I just get so inspired by that and I think there's so much artistic nature in so much of, of what people do, not just in the creative artistic sense, but even in sports, even in, I mean, watch the Olympics and tell me that you can't walk away from watching the Olympics inspired by people operating at sheer excellence. I just absolutely love watching people operate in their element. And I think that that inspires me so much. So I'll add that onto the question as well. Last question comes from Ryan Film Photos. And he asks, what are your favorite black and white photo books? And uh, I figured this is a great place to end and uh, I brought over just a couple books to, my light keeps shifting on me. Um, these are by no means uh, the absolute definitive list of Nick Mayo's favorite black and white books, but I did grab these off my bookshelf today and these are ones that I reference back to on a very, very regular basis. Um, no particular order, I'll just go from top to bottom. Um, but the first one here is Olympic Portraits by Annie Leibovitz. Um, I absolutely love this book. So this was the 1996 Olympics and Annie just went through and cataloged. I don't know if you guys could actually, me. there we go. She cataloged just so many different Olympic athletes. I didn't even mean to go from the idea of the Olympic athletes in the last question to this. Maybe it was because I had this book that was on top of mind, but just fantastic. I mean, to see a body of work that Annie Leibovitz had created from a single event in a single timeline is just astonishing. To see that all of this work, and it's fantastic work. I mean, there's a lot of people that have a lot of criticism and critique on Annie and some of the direction that she's taken with her, her photography and artwork. Uh, and I don't even want to talk about that, but just to, to see the depth and breadth of work that she created within a single year at a single event is just fantastic. So if you don't have this book in your collection, I'll link to it down below, but um, I found this at a thrift store at one point and I absolutely love this book. I refer back to it so many different times. Uh, the next book I would say is Ralph Gibson's uh, Ex Libres. Uh, it's a book all about books. So it's a book all about um, libraries and I absolutely love it. I, I talked about this in another video, but I love that this is a uh, retired library book. Like this was from a library. And then the fact that it's all about library books. Um, I got it online and I absolutely love, I mean, like I said, Ralph Gibson is one of my all time favorites. And him just going through and cataloging just all the different works at different uh, libraries across just the world. And there's just so many different details and the printing of the book, everything done in it is just absolutely fantastic. When we were out in New York, we actually swung by the uh, Soho uh, Leica gallery and they had this book 
on display there as well. And I just think it's absolutely fantastic. It's a great piece of work by uh, Ralph Gibson. Another one that I wanna point out from Ralph, I'll actually skip down to it, is Tropism. Um, this is another Ralph Gibson book. And this is a lot of his um, kind of famous work. There's a lot of iconic pieces in here. Um, and just so much of the detail work that I absolutely love and that inspires me. So these books of Ralph Gibson's, I, I refer back to on a constant basis to just kind of find more and more inspiration and just get to approach his work in a fresh new way. I take notes on this stuff and I, I just love going through and, and seeing just the way he sees the world, the way he, like I said, like this one's all documenting a single subject and just seeing how another photographer, especially someone that I admire, goes through and, and documents a single subject and tells that story or, you know, a series of subjects. I just find it inspiring and, and just, I absolutely love these books. These four books stay like pretty much out of my bookshelf 90% uh, of the time because I'm constantly looking through them. And then this last one is Fred Mortagne, or how do you say his name? He's French Fred. And this is, uh, I'm not even gonna try and say the Atropper uh, Value, but it's a skating book, but it's also a uh, geometric book. And like just the way that he tells the, the story of skaters in such a visually pleasing and geometric way is just fantastic. There's so many different pieces in here, you know, and like just the way that he plays with these, uh, these shapes and angles and it's just, again, so much of what I like to see in my own work and uh, just everything, like look at the geometric play in this and just the way that his composition really plays so well and is just so inspiring. So if you guys haven't seen this book, I definitely suggest going and getting it. It's his work from 2000 to 2015. And uh, if you're not following him on Instagram, it's French Fred and it's just fantastic. I love paying attention to his work, paying attention to what he does. Um, and I got that this Christmas and I've probably looked at it 15 times since then. It's just fantastic. So that's a wrap for this week's question and answer. Thank you guys for asking so many great questions. I hope my answers were thorough enough without getting too wordy. Uh, if not, well, thanks for staying tuned until the end and kind of burying through. But uh, we'll do another one of these. We'll continue doing these. I'll do them every once in a while, maybe every couple of months. Uh, so like I said in the beginning, be paying attention to at Nick Expose over on Instagram if you want to be a part of one of these in the future. Uh, I post up all of my behind the scenes stuff over there. I post up all of my questions, all of my work, not all of my work, but all the work that gets posted out there gets posted out there to Instagram. So I'd love to connect with you over there. And then uh, I'd love to hear any other questions. If you guys have any questions, ask them down below. I'd love to answer those uh, in the comments or uh, through Instagram or anything like that. And then uh, we will do more of these in the future. And if you're new to the channel, go ahead and check out some of the other content. I got like just tons of videos about creative content, creative process, um, some tutorials and different things like that. How to make a camera strap out of a leather belt, uh, how to make your zines, all that kind of stuff. So that's all over there on the channel. You can also like and subscribe down below, leave your comments down there. And then uh, Garth, if you're watching this, stay tuned to the end. We might do a little coffee adventure. Uh, but for everyone else, if you don't want to stick around for the coffee shenanigans, I appreciate you guys. I will see you guys on the next episode. And until then, uh, shoot more film, ask more questions, and uh, drink some real coffee. Don't drink that instant stuff. Drink the real good stuff. And uh, I'll see you then. Peace. All right, so it's a few days later. I picked up uh, some Nescafe Toaster's Choice. And uh, I'm not, <laughs> I don't know, I'm not too excited about this, but, uh, but we're gonna do it anyways. We're gonna see how this goes. And uh, let's brew up some coffee. First taste. Nope.